Turn with me to the book of James, and children, you're dismissed to your Sunday school classes. Well, we're beginning a new sermon series this morning, and we're in James, so it's toward the end of the New Testament after the book of Hebrews. Um, I hope some of you were able to read through it this past week. It takes about 15 minutes to read. I encourage you to read it straight through this week, maybe multiple times, maybe do that several times through the course of this, um, this series. Uh, if you don't have a Bible with you, you can find one under the seats nearby, and we'll be spending time working closely through a text, so it's helpful to have a copy of God's Word open. And this is on page 1011 in those Bibles under the chairs nearby. Um, and I encourage you to, if you, if you haven't really thought about this in a while, to bring a paper copy um, of your Word. I was having a conversation recently with some people just in light of um, studies are clearly showing there is a rapid decline in biblical literacy, um, not just among Christians, but people in general, uh, but certainly among Christians, we don't want that. And so we want an increase in biblical literacy. So awareness of basic content of the Bible, how to find your way around the Bible, where things are in the Bible. And in our conversation, you know, one of the things that came up that has probably contributed to this that we've maybe underappreciated is the loss of the use of the paper Bible. Uh, there's something with how our brains work that we don't remember things as well in, on a screen, but we know where things are in a book. So have a paper copy, have it your book for life. Um, no judgment if you don't bring it on Sunday. So this isn't going to create a new culture of like, well, you're using a phone. Totally cool. Use your phone. Use your screens here. We're all in different situations. But in general, uh, an opportunity just to reinforce the value of a paper copy of God's Word. It's a great gift to us. Well, one reason we are in James is because we value covering the whole sweep of Scripture. So in our sermon series, if you've ever wondered what's the rationale for why we pick a new series, well, a number of things go into it, conversations with elders, prayer, uh, what's on my mind and heart as I talk with people as well. But one reason is we just want to move around the whole sweep of the Bible. So Old and New Testaments typically alternating, moving around in different areas of the Bible. So Old Testament law, and prophets, gospels. Uh, letters uh, in the New Testament. And so we were in Leviticus recently and a short series on Jesus. So now we're going to go into something very different, which is just a short, punchy, pithy, practical book um, of James. So James chapter 1, verses 1 to 11 is where we'll be. So let's read this together. And as a reminder, anytime we hear uh, the Bible read, we are hearing God's very voice by the Spirit because this is His Word. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, and assumed brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete or whole, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him act, ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation, and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he'll pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word here. And we thank you for uh, giving it to us and empowering us to understand it and be transformed by it by the Holy Spirit. So we pray that you would... Uh, open our eyes to behold the wondrous things here. Help us see Christ and his wisdom clearly and be transformed by the Spirit. Amen. Well, let me just orient us a bit to this book before we look more closely at it. So James is referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament by some because it's about wisdom for life. It's very practical. It addresses topics like wealth and poverty, genuine faith versus non-saving faith the importance of obeying God's Word, not just hearing it, but obeying, the power of our words, how to understand and get through conflict, and so forth. The book applies the wisdom of Jesus to the practicalities of 
life. So it gives us the wisdom from above in order to live well in God's world. It was written by James, most likely the half-brother of Jesus. So James grew up in the same family as Jesus, and he didn't know what to think about Jesus during his life and ministry, but then at some point he came to faith in Christ. So he now opens the book here by calling himself a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, the King Jesus Christ, Christ not his last name, but the Messiah, the anointed one, the long-expected king who renew all things. So he's acknowledging Jesus, his own half-brother, as in fact the true Lord and king. And he's writing to Christians, probably mainly Jewish believers, and in opening, the opening verse he calls them something surprising. He calls these Christians the 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel at the time, as a nation, had largely rejected Jesus. So he's not writing to the ethnic tribes of Israel. He's writing to Jewish Christians. But he calls them this because they are now the true Israel. They're the ones who have embraced the Jewish Messiah, and anyone who comes to faith in Jesus is now grafted in and part of the true Israel. So you and I If you are in Christ, whether or not you are ethnically Jewish or not, you are now part of this Jewish-rooted community, part of the 12 tribes of Israel, the true 12 tribes of Israel. So he's writing to Christians, calling them that, and he says, notice that they're the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So that language was first used of the Jewish exiles who had been scattered around the world or out of their land. And it became used by Christians to refer to how we are still not yet fully home with God. We are exiles here. Here, James is probably having both senses in mind in the sense that he's probably using it to refer to Christians who were scattered from their homes, uh, from from Jerusalem. So James led the early church in Jerusalem, and the Christians were persecuted at one point. And they scattered and had to leave their homeland around into other nations. And so James probably now writing this letter to them. He's writing to Christians who are now displaced. They're refugees. And we learn from the letter that most of them are probably poor and probably oppressed, even if mildly, for their faith. So why is he writing this letter to them? Well, the one word that can summarize his goal is wholeness in the sense of being undivided and not lacking anything, being whole. The lens through which James sees their lives is that their problem is dividedness, and they need to become whole or undivided. So here's what I mean. The problem that James sees is that the people he's writing to, these Christians, are divided in many ways, through and through, and this is still true of us. So he says at one point that they're double-minded. So we trust God sometimes, and then we doubt his care. We have divided loyalties. He says that we can be like adulterous people who compromise in our relationship with the Lord. He says we have divided relationships that are filled with conflict or separation. And this is because we have divided passions. So there is a conflict within ourselves with our desires that war against each other. And That leads to division outside of our lives. And we also divide things that actually belong together. Faith and works belong together. And we can tend to separate them, he says. Or the rich and poor belong together. And we can begin to separate them and treat one as better than another. And because of this, we're not whole. We're not single-minded and wholeheartedly sincere in our faith. So James says that there's something that can heal this deep, pervasive, multifaceted dividedness. And it's what he calls in chapter 3, the wisdom from above. This is the wisdom of Jesus that can heal our dividedness. So James is writing to people like us who have come to know the risen Lord Jesus. So if you are a believer here, I know not everyone here is, but if you're a believer, you are trusting in the risen Lord Jesus, therefore you're like the first recipients of this letter And yet, like them, we also have challenges in our lives. And so he's applying the wisdom of Jesus to the practicalities of our lives and problems. And we'll hear throughout this letter echoes of the wisdom of Jesus that we hear in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, or the other gospel accounts. So what James has learned well from Jesus, 
He's applying it so that our divided lives will become whole. So who is James for then? Five kinds of people. It's for new Christians who need guidance on what wholehearted Christian living looks like. So maybe you have become a believer in the last few days or few weeks or couple years. What does it look like to be a wholehearted Christian? Second, it's for inconsistent Christians who trust Christ but have some aspects of their life that are not consistent with their faith. It's for nominal or cultural Christians who are those who think that they're Christians. They have intellectually agreed with truth about Jesus, but they need to be challenged to have true saving faith, as James would say, a faith that's not useless and isn't dead, but is living and active. It's for plateaued Christians who maybe you feel like you're no longer actively working and growing to become like Jesus. You can think of a time in your life when you had passion and zeal, you were killing sin, you were thinking about aspects of your life that were out of step with Jesus, and you were adjusting them, and then lately, you're just kind of showing up, doing your thing. You know, people don't think you're a bad person. You've kind of ordered the big things in your life. Just kind of plateaued. So this is a book that challenges you. And then finally, it's for those who are not yet Christians, to give them a picture, to give you a picture of what non-hypocritical, real Christianity looks like. So this morning, we're looking at the opening section, these first 11 verses. They may seem disconnected at first, jumping from one topic to another, but James is addressing the same big idea here. He's introducing his main goal for Christians, which is to be whole or complete and lacking nothing in Christ And he's addressing how to pursue this in the midst of the hardships of life. So this is about how to pursue Christian wholeness in a life filled with trials. So here's the question this morning. What do we do when life is hard? How do we handle trials and challenges and suffering uniquely as Christians? Is there a difference in the way that we handle these things? And James says we need three things when life is hard. We need a perspective a prayer, and a posture. And there's one command he gives associated with each of these. So we'll walk through each of these and see the one thing that we're called to in each case. So first, we need a perspective. So James, as I've mentioned, is writing mainly to Jewish Christians who were probably scattered away from their homes. They had to move away. From later in this letter, we learn that most were poor. They were probably mainly day laborers, and they were being exploited by the rich and maybe mocked for their faith. James doesn't get specific here with their trials, though. Notice he just says in verse 2 that they meet various trials. It's general because the perspective James is giving is not just, giving is not just for when we face certain kinds of trials, but it's for any trial. So you may have serious health concerns right now that frighten you. Or maybe you have to embrace the challenges of caring for a child who has mental challenges. Or maybe you're young and you have your whole life ahead of you and you have a physical disability. Um, Or given your parents or grandparents, you think that there's going to be something coming to you um, that will be a challenge for your life. Or you feel lonely and isolated right now in life and you wonder if it'll ever change. Those are all the kinds of things included in various trials, whatever your trial is. And James says, in all of these trials... We need a perspective. Here's the command of this section, verse 2. Consider it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. Now, that at first may sound inconsiderate. Talking to suffering people about how they're to count trials as joy. And it's true that you don't just quote this verse to people without any empathy. So don't go up to people who are in suffering, and just shoot them a quick verse like this. There's a place for that. We don't neglect this, but we do this in the context of relationship with wisdom of timing. So this could feel at first inconsiderate, uh, and it's counterintuitive here. James is teaching us something utterly unique about how Christians go through trials. Everyone faces hard things, but there's something unique about how Christians can do this. They can have, he's saying, a deep and true joy even in the midst 
of grief and sorrow and trials. It's counterintuitive because trials are by loss or by definition about loss. So in any trial you're facing, can't you just think of it in one sense as losing something, right? It's taking something away from you you wish you had. And so viewed narrowly, in and of itself, every trial is about loss and sadness. James isn't saying that there's no room for grief here, but he is saying that there is a way to have joy in any situation. You can receive trials as an occasion for joy. You may not feel immediately happy, but you can have a settled attitude of joy in the midst of trials and with other emotions. But this is incredibly hard. The English Puritan pastor Thomas Goodwin said that this is the strangest paradox that ever was or can be uttered. So let's not take this lightly as as though this is some kind of like just easy Christian thing to do here. He also said this is the hardest duty that was ever required of distressed hearts because it is a command. This isn't just saying if if you have the kind of personality and you're in the mood, maybe consider how perhaps kind of you might have a little bit of maybe joy in some of your suffering. He's saying you got trials Count it all joy. The hardest duty that was ever required of distressed hearts. How in the world can we do it? And the key is perspective. The question is not whether or not we'll suffer. We all will in various ways. The question is, how do you interpret your suffering? James shows us the key perspective in verses 3 and 4. He's giving the reason for why he says we can count our our trials with joy. He says, For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete or whole, lacking in nothing. So that's the reason why we can have joy in the midst of trials, because our trials are part of a bigger, divinely orchestrated purpose. Do you see the progression that James gives here? Our trials are leading somewhere. They have a bigger bigger purpose. So there's three steps in this progression. Testing, which leads to steadfastness, and when steadfastness has its full effect, it leads to completeness. So this first step is testing. So our trials test our faith. The testing here is not testing to see if it's real or not. It's not like passing a test. The word refers to the kind of testing we do when we might test metals to make them more pure. It's refining. So people test metals by putting them in some kind of crucible to move them in such a way and change them in such a way so the impurities come out. God views your faith like a precious metal. He sees it as worth testing to make pure. So when trials come into your life, you can know that one reason they are there is because God values your trust in Him. He values your faith. And so He's testing it because it's worth more to Him than all the gold in the universe that He's made. He's testing it to refine it because He loves you. And then this testing leads to Steadfastness. As we experience trials, we learn steadfastness and patience and endurance. Growing in steadfastness is somewhat similar to growing in endurance in order to run a marathon. So I have several friends who run marathons. Some of you do this. You can't just start running a marathon. I certainly can't. You have to train for a long time. You have to put your body to the test. And as it's tested, it gets stronger. You get more endurance. You're able to handle more. Maybe you can think back on some of the trials in your own life. Were you more often anxious and prone to quit back then? Have Over time, have you been able to become stronger, more steadfast? Can you endure more? And steadfastness isn't just an end in itself. This leads to a next goal. So this isn't just kind of a what doesn't kill you makes you stronger kind of verse. It has a goal, and it's for us to become complete. It's for us to become whole. Look again at that progression in verse 4. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. 
So this is the primary goal of the letter of James, that we would be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So he's saying that at the outset, this is the goal. To become perfect is about reaching this goal. It's the goal for which Christ saved us. The word complete can be translated as whole. So God is using trials to lead us to become more whole, complete, wholehearted, undivided. He wants us to be complete and not lacking any moral virtue. In other words, He wants us to become like Jesus. This is the reason why we can count our trials as joy. So when we zoom in, when you zoom in and look at whatever trial you have, you can view it as, of course, a hardship, and you can see, I don't see any reason for joy looking at this in and of itself. Some of the suffering is nearly unspeakable. But when we zoom out and see this in the bigger picture, with a bigger perspective, we see a purpose. We see that trials are part of a progression of testing that leads to steadfastness that's intended to lead to maturity. It's very similar to what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 5. Listen for the progression in this. We rejoice in our sufferings. I count it all joy when you face various trials knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, completeness, wholeness, perfection, maturity, and character produces hope. So we can rejoice in suffering because it produces endurance, which produces character that is like Jesus. Every situation, then, can be an occasion for joy. This is not the only emotion for every occasion, but it's always possible. It's not saying the trial itself is a joy. Suffering can be sinful and evil, but it's saying that God is in charge, and every trial is being used by Him to help us become more like Christ. In other words, Romans 8, 28 is true. We know that for those who love God, all things, including the various trials, work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. And that purpose, as we read on there, is to become like Jesus for His glory. So God is sovereign over all things. He causes or permits all that happens. And He does so with infinitely wise and good purposes, even if they are mysterious to us right now. And one of those purposes is to transform us to become complete and whole like Christ. Because of this, we can mingle joy with our sorrows. So, what do we need when life is hard? The first thing we need is a perspective. We need to count it all joy. It's, the, it's one thing now to know that we should have this perspective in trials. It's another to actually have it. So, how can we actually get this perspective when we're in the midst of trials? Well, this is the second thing we need. It's a prayer. And here's the command that goes with this. Ask God for wisdom. The wisdom we need in suffering is something only God can give us. So James calls us to ask God for wisdom. This is verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Now, this isn't complicated then. If you lack wisdom, ask God for it, and he will give it. It shows us two realities about this kind of prayer. We see how God gives and how we should ask. So how does God give? He gives generously. When we pray, we can come to God knowing that He's eager to answer our prayer for wisdom. I've often drawn attention to Hebrews 11.6, which shows us what real faith is all about. It says this, without faith, it is impossible to please Him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that He exists and that He rewards those who seek Him. So if you're going to draw near to God, you have to believe two things that He exists, and that He is a giver, not a taker. This is who He is. He is a rewarder. God is by nature generous. And James says that He gives without reproach. What does that mean? Well, to give without reproach means to give without any sense of rejecting you or demeaning you. It means to give without a sense of reluctance. So, if you're in a trial and you don't know how to respond, and you're struggling to find joy and see the wise perspective, he's not annoyed by you. If you ask him for wisdom, he's not going to say, you should know better by now. He's going to give you wisdom. That's how he gives. How should we ask then? James tells us in verses 6 to 8, 
But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded, divided man, unstable in all his ways. So if it's true that God gives without reluctance, how should we ask? Well, that we ask in a way that trusts that this is true of him. We need to ask him without doubting his heart. We need to ask without doubting his generosity. We need to ask for the wisdom we need in trials without doubting that he'll actually give the wisdom we need. The man who asks God for wisdom while doubting is double-minded here. It's one of the ways that people are divided in James. This person is of two minds. She asks God for wisdom, but then she doubts him and keeps worrying and figures he won't give it. She throws up the prayer half-hearted not firmly convinced that God will actually help her through this. So whatever trial you're going through, God is inviting you to ask him for wisdom. He's inviting you to trust his good character and his love and his generosity. This isn't a complicated step to take. It's simply asking God for the wisdom you need. I was just in a conversation a few days ago um, with someone who was going through a trial and he asked me for advice and uh, he knows I'm a Christian and a pastor, and so he's, he's like, what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say to do, or does it talk about what to do when you're in a hard situation and you're not sure what decision to make? And I thought, well, this is a good week for me to have this question asked of me. I have this verse on my mind. So I was able to share one of the things that we're to do, and it's simply to ask God. Ask God for wisdom. He loves to give it. Of course, there's more. Ask other friends for counsel. Read God's Word. But ask God for wisdom. It's not complicated, but your heart may be like mine. Mine is just wired default against this because of my selfishness, short-sightedness, and sin. So I'm wired to worry about things or try to figure them out on my own rather than just asking God. And so just this past week, I had a very hard trial, and I failed in many ways with my attitude. I had a bad attitude, angry, frustrated, not counting it as of joy. And I wasn't even thinking about this verse. Studying this verse for a few hours, go about my day, face a frustrating situation, frustrated, bothered, annoyed, angry. Next day, studying this verse for a few hours, totally disconnected. (laughs) And then this morning, I was just starting to think of the trial again, as you may do when you wake up. Your mind just goes to things, right? And I thought about verse 2. I'm to count this trial as joy because it produces steadfastness in me, which leads to maturity of character, completeness. And it was so hard, though, when I was thinking about this frustrating reality in my life, and then I was bringing this verse to bear, and I wasn't yet thinking of the rest of the passage, I was thinking of verse 2, and I just, I said to God, God, how is this possible? How am I going to be able to do this? Like, I do not see it. Like, my emotional state is totally not in line with verse 2 when I think of this situation. I don't even know how to get there. And then I was like, oh, that's verse (laughs) 5. Ask God for wisdom. Ask God for this perspective. So I asked him to help me, and I trust that he'll answer. So this is a reminder that it's one thing to know these verses It's one thing to even have them memorize. I encourage you to memorize maybe the book of James for this series. Christine and I tried to do that years ago. I think you got further than me. I got like maybe half, three quarters she got further. Uh, So I've had this verse memorized. It was there. It wasn't in my heart. It wasn't functional in my life. Only God can help us do this. So this path is not complicated, but it does require supernatural help. So we need a perspective and we need a prayer. Ask God for wisdom. Final thing we need when life is hard is a posture. And here's the command that goes with this. Boast in your true position. Whether you are rich or poor, trials will come. And what kind of posture toward your trials do you need to have? James says, do not let your circumstances and your trials shape your sense of identity. Don't view your socioeconomic status as your truest status, no matter what circumstances you find yourself in. And whether you're rich or poor, 
Here's what posture you can have. You can boast in your true position in Christ. So what does this mean? Well, he addresses the lowly Christian and then the rich person or rich Christian. So lowly Christian, verse 9. Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation. Boasting isn't always prideful or bad. To boast is simply to exalt in something, to take joy in something, to brag about something, to find hope in something. The problem happens when we boast in ourselves, which of course is natural to our fallen hearts and pervasive in our culture. But here James invites the lowly Christian to boast in something, to boast in his exaltation. So what is their exaltation? Well, it's probably some way of getting at our exalted new status in Christ as heirs of eternal life. So in a few verses, he'll remind them that they have a crown of life coming, which is a metaphor for their eternal life with Christ and joy with Him in a new creation. It's a metaphor for that. So they're going to inherit the world. They're eternally wealthy and secure. So James is saying, even if you're poor and rejected in this life, your true position in Christ is secure, and it's better. So hope in Him, rejoice in His kindness to you. When you suffer, your exalted status in Christ, now and forever, is immovable. So don't just grieve your present trial, boast. Find your hope in, brag about, speak about your exalted status in Christ. And what about the rich person? Verses 10 to 11. And let the rich boast in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he'll pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, its flower falls, its beauty perishes, so also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuit. So a rich person looks like he's blossoming right now, or she's blossoming right now like a flower, but just wait. As time goes on, we all wither. We'll all pass away. We'll fade away, eventually die. So James is saying for the rich person to boast in his or her humiliation. This may be referring to just rich people in general viewed as uh, in this context, maybe the rich that are oppressing Christians in this context. So he's, this might be a way of James kind of poetically encouraging Christians to have hope. You get to exo- uh, rejoice in your exalted status, and then the rich can exalt in their humiliation as they fade away and die in all their pursuits and it becomes worthless. Or it's an encouragement to uh, the rich Christians, brothers and sisters, that even though they're wealthy now, do not boast in that. It's all a gift from God anyways. Instead, boast in what matters most and what's of lasting significance in your lowly status in Jesus, humbly before him. And of course, he'll exalt you with true exaltation, but you boast that the riches you have are going to fade away. They don't ultimately matter eternally. The success that you've accumulated for yourself, you're like a flower of the field. It's going to fade away. Boast in that because you have something that's of greater value. So the lowly can boast in their exaltation in Christ. The rich can remember their wealth will fade away. So how will you respond? How are you and I going to respond to the trials we're facing now or will face in this week or next month or several years out? Whenever we have a sermon here on suffering, there's really two kinds of people that this is for. It's for those of you who are in suffering right now, and really all of us are in different ways, of course, but you may have a relationship that's really hard right now a job that you can't stand, a coworker who bullies you, a classmate in school who's bullying you. In our culture, you may lose your job because of your moral convictions and trust in Jesus and unwillingness to compromise. So that's for you. Second, it's also for those who, those of you who may not feel like you're in any kind of serious trial. Life seems to be smooth right now, but you will suffer in the future. So this sermon is here to prepare you so that when it comes, you have the wisdom that you need. You'll be able to endure it because suffering's coming, whether you're a student, whether you're in high school, college, younger, or you've gone through a lot of life already, but you've not yet faced great tragedy, it's coming. And this sermon is here to give you a perspective and a prayer and a posture. So as we wrap up, I want to remind us of the one who gives us this wisdom. Jesus himself embraced this posture for us. 
He was exalted from eternity past, and He became poor and lowly for our sake. He faced all the kinds of trials that we faced. And as He faced the trial of the cross, which He did not deserve, but He endured for us, Hebrews 12 said He did it for the joy set before Him. He was not viewing it in isolation, but part of a bigger purpose, and for the joy of bringing you to faith and giving you hope in suffering, and then His own glory in rulership and in partnership. So he's, it's leading to the resurrection, and He's going to rescue us, and that's the joy before Him. So He rejoiced at His trials, even for our sake. And He's the reason we can boast in our exaltation, even when we're lowly. It's because He became lowly for us in His incarnation and the cross. He died for us and rose again so that we can have a bright future and forgiveness and a future to boast in. And so we no longer need to be joyless in suffering. We can consider it joy when we face trials. We don't have to try to find our own wisdom to navigate hardship. We can ask God, who gives generously. We don't have to find our identity in our worldly position, whether it's good or bad, rich or poor, rising or falling. We can find it secure in Christ. And so, what do we do? This is the question of the morning. What do we do when life is hard? Count it all joy, ask God for wisdom, and boast in your true position. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank You for giving us hope and purpose in the midst of the sorrows of this life. And we thank You that even though we endure hardship and face trials of various kinds, You're not on the sidelines worried and merely sad and hoping it turns out different for us and distressed when it doesn't. Though You grieve uh, with us and care for us, you have greater purposes that we don't always see for what you allow in our lives. And so we pray that you would give us wisdom. Give us the wisdom we need in order to endure the testing so that we might be perfect and complete in Christ, conformed to Jesus' image, reflecting your greatness and glory. I pray that your spirit would do this. In Jesus' name, amen.